Good day, everyone, and welcome to our Momenta webinar on digital industry investing. My name is Ken Forster, and I'm the executive director of Momenta. Now, just a few housekeeping notes before we kick off. Today's presentation is being recorded. Links to the presentation and recording will be sent to you within 24 hours. Now, we plan for a Q&A session at the end, so please submit the questions in Bright Talk anytime through the presentation. Now, today we have an all-star panel of Momenta Venture leaders. Stephen Berard, our CTO, who is based in Grenoble, France. Ben Stephen and Lee Carter, our investors, respectively in San Francisco and Boston. And Ryan McManus, who leads our acceleration efforts and is based out of Chicago. Now, over the next hour, we're going to share our best practices in investing in digital industry, from targeting and assessing, to integrating and accelerating. I'll start by setting the context with a brief introduction of Momenta and discussing some of the fundamentals of digital industry. Stephen will define what we mean by venture industrialists and outline how we target companies of interest. Ben will review our investment assessment criteria and approach. Lee will discuss how we integrate our portfolio companies into our ecosystem. And finally, Ryan will discuss our post-investment acceleration approach. We'll wrap it up with a short Q&A session. So again, please have your questions ready. Now we founded Moment in 2012 with the observation that the IoT was not new or novel, but a continuation of progressive waves of digitalization from telemetry and industrial automation to RFID and machine to machine, transforming industries we knew and loved. We adopted the term digital industry to describe this next wave of digitally catalyzed innovation. Now, we saw that success for companies in digital industry often came down to three critical factors, deep experience, catalytic leadership, and smart capital. So we launched Momenta around three practices, strategic advisory, retained executive search, and venture capital, serving young disruptive startups and the Fortune 500 industrial and technology leaders. Now, we're hyper-focused on just four industrial sectors, energy utilities, manufacturing, smart spaces, so think smart cities, buildings and farms, and supply chain, including transportation. And more specifically, the digitalization of these sectors through enabling technology clusters, what we call DNA for devices, networks, and applications. Now, since our founding almost a decade ago, we've had the honor of serving over 150 clients, placing over 250 leaders, investing in over 40 companies, and all while maintaining a regular dialogue with our 20,000 industry contacts. Now, we're known by the company we keep with great brands such as ABB, Carrier, Raytheon, SAP, Schneider Electric, and many others, who engage us for our deep industry expertise, relationships, and innovation ecosystem. Now, we're also proud to have invested in over 40 early stage digital industry disruptors spanning Europe, North America, and APAC with six solid exits to industry leaders. Now, digital industry is not simply the application of digital technology, a mistake many traditional investors make. In reality, there are actually three key catalysts that really uh, create digital industry as we know it. Number one, digital industry is the culmination of successive technology waves proceeding from centralized computing to distributed and now ubiquitous computing. Of course, all of these have been powered by Moore's law with dramatic decreases in the cost of sensors, bandwidth processing and storage, making technology accessible for even the simplest of use cases. Second catalyst, the technology building blocks emerging from these waves from internet, social and mobile to big data analytics, IoT and robotics, are converging with a new economic paradigm to create what we like to call combinatorial innovation. Now, Jeremy Rifkin in his seminal book, The Zero Marginal Cost Society, outlined how this innovation creates new business models and disruptive scenarios. As an example, internet, mobile, geo-positioning when coupled with the new economic paradigm of the sharing economy has catalyzed a disruptive scenario we call ride sharing. These disruptive scenarios are the very foundation for digital industry. Now, the third catalyst for digital industry is purely economic, the opportunity to reposition or expand one's place in the value chain. So the traditional design to deployment cycles for OEM equipment have been largely static and sequential, moving goods and services downstream to end users. But what happens to this well-established order when the OEM at one end of the value chain provides a smart device that sits at the other end of the value chain and talks to that OEM? 
This positions the OEM to be the first to provide value-added services or new disruptive business models, such as providing their product as a service. This is what we think of as horizontal business cases, those that span actors, use cases, and geographies. Now, the adoption of these three catalysts is forecast to create significant value for society and industry. Per the World Economic over one World Economic Forum, over $100 trillion of value by 2025, creating new business opportunities for industry and higher standards of living for society. And we are just at the beginning. The next wave of digital industry is at the edge with intelligent sensors, low power networks, and micro analytics. The edge fabric is expected to generate 90% of our global data by 2025 with 80% process at the edge and only 20% in the cloud, the inverse of what that is today. This means that the connect, collect, and correct functions of an IoT platform will happen on the very sensors themselves. We believe warranting a new name, AIoT, combination of AI and IoT. Therefore, we named our most recent investment fund the AIoT Ecosystem Fund. Now with his intelligence moving to the edge, we see simple monitoring quickly being surpassed by optimization. Adaptive behavior both at the sensor and edge network forming an autonomous nerve system for digital industry. To manage this intelligence and complexity, we also see a new genre of low and no code platforms allowing assembly of application building blocks across this fabric. And all of this will hasten the migration of the linear and static value chains we just discussed earlier, creating value networks and ecosystems of people, systems, and things. Finally, there are probably three key S words that, that we believe will guide and define these moves. Security, so think cybersecurity, sovereignty, think data governance and protection, and sus sustainability, so think resilience and e efficiency. Now with any opportunities comes challenges and Gartner's recent survey of barriers to IoT success serve really as a roadmap to why Momenta invests and collaborates with our companies the way it does. Three key elements in terms of our co-creation to overcome these barriers. Number one, of course, we provide smart capital to quickly scale and catalyze, scale the company and catalyze other investors. But we also provide community, integrating our portfolio companies into a deep ecosystem of peer leaders, opportunities to participate in roundtables and how to sell into industrials or how to attract and retain key talent while operating remotely. Imagine having 40 other CEOs of similar companies that you can call for help. This is our Momenta community in action. Finally, collaboration. The old adage that it takes a village to raise a child certainly applies to digital industry startups. So in addition to our Momenta deep advisory and talent services, we partner with some of the largest names in industry to explore joint commercial opportunities and strategic partnerships. Now with that, let me turn it over to Stephen Berard to cover what we mean by venture industrialists and discuss how we target possible portfolio companies. Stephen? Thanks, Ken. Hello, everyone. As Ken mentioned, I'm gonna talk a bit about what we mean by venture industrialists. While traditional venture capital has shied away from industrial applications and hardware, there's been a, a rise in a new class of venture investors, the, what we term the venture industrialist. Slow, steady improvement is something that is typically unexciting to most in Silicon Valley. But to a venture industrialist, this is very interesting. Even small improvements to large capital and or resource intensive uh, operations, such as we see in industry, can yield massive results. It's the power of 1% better. I'm going to talk a little bit now on this next slide about what we mean by the venture, indu venture industrialist and how that compares and contrasts between a venture capitalist and a venture industrialist. So a venture capitalist will invest broadly in a technology sector, while a venture industrialist, by its very name, will invest very uh, with a very uh, deep focus on digital industry. A venture capitalist will focus on return on investment, looking to make quick and profitable exits for their investors, where a venture industrialist will focus more on that long-term gain game, building value over time. Like I mentioned, that, that's slow, steady progress, but with massive scale behind it. 
a venture capitalist will desire scale through customer adoption, will, will grow things by acquiring more customers and, and getting more people to adopt their product. Where a venture industrialist will look to scale through deployment, uh, deployment adoption, getting uh, their solution out to more machines, more factories, and more customers, um, and plants, and, and, and industrial um, operations. A venture capitalist looks for companies at the growth stage, where a venture industrialist will look for companies that have great ideas, often much uh, sooner than, than the growth stage, looking for people who, who have good ideas and, and um, good solutions that can be applied to one or more sectors of industry. A venture capital, capitalist will help build leadership and then scale the business where a venture industrialist will be more of a consultant and advisor to these companies, helping them to develop their solutions, networking and building that, that ecosystem around that, and ultimately um, helping them through those channels. Now, we started with this mindset several years ago, and we've made a number of bets in these areas. As you'll hear from myself and some of our co my colleagues later on in the presentations, these, pe these bets have played out very well for us. Now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about three digital industry trends that we're paying attention to. So the first digital industry tr trend is intelligence at the edge. And Ken spoke a lot about um, I AI, ML, and, and, and things moving to the edge. And this is, this is a trend that we're seeing really strongly. So as edge computing becomes more powerful, techniques such as AI and ML are migrating to the very edges of the network. Um, we're now seeing novel approaches that are being developed to effectively develop, deploy, um, these intelligence, even to the most farthest edge devices, those things running on battery or in even remote, very remote locations. Uh, for example, techniques such as TinyML enable sophisticated AI algorithms to run uh, very efficiently, even on the most constrained devices, things running in microcontrollers and, and typically on battery. So this allows for a new type of intelligent sensors and thus uh, also the applications that use those to be possible. So um, I think a nice good concrete example is, you know, Rather than having a video camera send a large um, fat stream of data to some cloud service to be analyzed for, for image recognition, we are now seeing end devices being able to do that processing locally. So now instead of that video stream being sent up, you're seeing the, the count of people potentially in a, in a public space or the number of cars that pass through a particular intersection and just the results of those being sent up to the cloud. So that saves a tremendous amount of resources, reducing costs, reducing bandwidth and, and, and other things. It allows things to be powered on battery and it also allows for addressing some things like privacy concerns because now you're not sending people's face images or license plate numbers up to the cloud where they have to be protected or anonymized. This is ultimately leading to a cooperative model between the edge and the cloud. As Ken said, the, the balance is flipping, but it's not going from 100% to zero or, or flipping around. It, it's going to always be this balance between the two. Um, and so now you're seeing edge devices that are operating in the field. They're going to operate in real time. They're collecting data. They're processing raw signals. In some cases, even responding locally. This is then shared up um, to a, a central solution in the cloud or poten potentially on-premise where it can be analyzed. And, and we can do this analysis over a population of devices, um, over large amounts of historical data, because, uh, again, we have the, those resources in the cloud. Um, and provide a lot more um, analysis across that wider population and thus providing greater visibility into operations. Like I mentioned before, we made some bets in here and then there's three bets that I'd like to, to talk about here. First is Edge Impulse. Edge Impulse provides an end-to-end -end development platform for ML and AI on edge devices. Another bet we've made is Litmus Automation. They're a modern edge platform for digital industry. Um, a third one here is Pulse Industrial. This is an example of one of those smart sensors that I talked about. In this case, they have a smart sensor that's using acoustics to measure steam trap and steam trap failures. So the second digital industry trend is data acquisition and, and management. So to deliver on the promise of IoT, data, often in large amounts of it, are required. So for example, a predictive maintenance uh, solution generally requires a, a large amount of data to characterize machine behavior analyze it, and ultimately find anomalies. Now, there's a bit of a last mile problem here. Um, many of these industrial systems are connectable, but uh, through, through interfaces such as Modbus, OPC UA, and BACnet. However, establishing such connections is generally very labor intensive. It's often error prone. It requires specialized code or highly detailed provisioning. Now, thankfully, we're starting to see solutions for data in integration in the OT space. We've seen this trend happen in the IT space. We're now si starting to see this in the OT space. Another challenge around here uh, in this space, too, is not just connectivity. 
um, and connecting to these sources of the data, but it's routing, processing, and acting on this behavior. So it's one thing to connect to a machine. It's another thing to make sure that that telemetry from that machine gets to where it needs to be with the necessary context and done so in a timely manner. Storage and retrieval are also things that are a really big challenge. Um, a few of the bets that we've talked about here, um, again, I talked about litmus automation on the previous slide. Um, Crate.io, they provide a uh, IoT specific data solution for handling the, the key challenges around um, managing data in the IoT space. Um, Highlight, that's an example of one of these uh, data integration solutions that allows for modeling and managing of plant floor data at the edge. Now, the last trend that I'll talk about is low code uh, and application integration. Again, Ken mentioned this earlier. So while data management and processing is moving to the edge where data is created, it's often utilized higher up in the stack where it can provide value and usually value across a population of, of devices. This is generally on the cloud or on-premise applications. So there's a need here to bring together data from a multitude of sources um, so that these, these data can be visualized, trends can be analyzed, um, anomalies detected, and then ultimately integration with the rest of these systems. Ken talked earlier on his slide um, uh, with the Gartner survey, talking about the barriers to success and technical complexity was the top barrier listed. Integration was the number three uh, barrier as well. Load low code platforms help address the complexity here. And again, this is a trend that we've seen in IT, um, also in mobile, and we're seeing it in IoT as well. Now we've not made any major investments in this area, but it is an area that we're keeping an eye, our, eye out for opportunities. So now that I've spoken about what a venture industrial is and some of the trends we have in digital industry, I'm gonna hand it over to Ben, who will talk about how we find winning investments in the digital industry space. Ben? Yeah, hey, uh, thanks, Stephen, for a great intro to the Venture Industrialist. Um, my name is Ben Stephen. I'm a principal at Momenta Ventures in San Francisco. And in this segment, I will share with you how we assess potential investments and find winners in the digital industry space. So uh, for the assessment of potential investments, we have developed our own targeted approach, which we call the six Momenta M's. Each M stands for one investment criterion, and here in uh, no particular order. We're looking at mission, which is the strategic fit to our investment thesis. Management, where we assess the strength of the team, industrial DNA, and alignment with investors. Momentum is an indicator for maturity and traction of the business. Um, we're looking at the size of the opportunity for the startup. Uh, at money, we're looking at the parameters of the round, valuation, and the business model. And finally, we're trying to assess how the um, investment fits into the Momenta ecosystem. Um, here's an example of one of the tools we are using on a day-to-day -day basis. This is a Harvey Ball framework uh, that helps us provide high-level overviews and uh, compare different opportunities. So we use this for different criteria per fund and also adjust this for other type of comparisons. Uh, here you see the six M's, but Lee is also going to show a different example later in this webinar. Uh, following, I'm going to show you a quick example of one of the companies in our portfolio and uh, how we fit this into our framework. So this is Axino. Axino is the latest addition to our Digital Industry Fund One portfolio. We closed the investments in January of this year. Uh, Axino is a Swiss company and a leading IoT food safety company. Um, this is an AIoT company. Um, so as Ken described, riding the next wave of digital industry. The solution combines a sensor and AI-powered analytics solution. Uh, which is contactless tracking of temperature and, and um, like analytics and forecasting of core temperature of food, which is one of the key parts of uh, or to measure food quality. Um, so initially, they are targeting the food retail sector. There is uh, already um, in their initial target market 100,000 locations among only the top 15 um, retail chains in Europe and the US alone. Um, the um, deal structure, Momenta led this deal, and it was the first external money which uh, went into Axino. Now let's take a look how this stacks up into our 6M approach. So um, when we were assessing these different parts, starting with the, let's say, easier one on the mission side, um, we do not consider this a retail investment. This is a uh, cold chain automation technology. So it's a really good fit into our investment themes. Um, Axino's opportunities go far beyond just retail. And it's a great fit to our theme one. Stephen explained this in detail, the intelligence at the edge. So when we assessed management, we found uh, that the CTO here, Purani, is a great leader for the existing team, 
very experienced practitioner. Uh, he was the brain behind this solution, very deep industry DNA. Uh, momentum, well, we found Migros, the leading Swiss um, retailer for, uh, for food as a lighthouse customer. So there are already thousands of devices um, which were installed with Migros. And we also found a very strong pipeline with leading, other leading retailers in Europe and beyond. Uh, when we analyzed the addressable market, so as I mentioned, just the first step of the addressable market, um, we found that there are already 100,000 retail markets where the sensor can be installed. On top of that, there is additional wholesale locations and then a huge opportunity along the entire cold chain from production all the way to retail. Uh, when we looked at money, we found that the transaction size and the stage are great fit for our fund one. And the business model, a very important part we're looking at. Um, Axino is at the point where they're transitioning from a, let's say, sensor sale to a majority recurring revenue business. And finally, MEV, this is where the entire investment case comes together. So we already started during the due diligence process um, with an acceleration plan where we are addressing upsides in these different M's. So first part was that uh, even before the transaction, we worked closely with, uh, with EHUB, the CTO, um, on the SaaS transition, which I mentioned earlier, to um, create more recurring revenue, which relates to the money M. And immediately after close, we already used our resources to strengthen management. So we helped Axino hire a new CEO, Mario Vogeli, a very seasoned manager. We helped them hire Otto Schmitz, a very experienced VP in sales, which ties into the execution part of Momentum. And we also used additional Momenta resources to help Axino achieve their full potential. So Stephen Barat is helping them to evaluate and um, continue the sensor technology development. We strengthened, strengthened their relationship with Semtech, which is a key technology partner to Axino, and also Momenta's partner in our uh, industry fund too. And we already lined up uh, the next round of financing. So short term, within the six, first six weeks after investment, we already used our Momenta ecosystem, MEV, to improve management, momentum, and money, tying together four of the six M's. And uh, these first steps are done to create long-term value. Uh, further long-term opportunities are additional resources we have, very patient capital, and uh, other support can come from our channel experts, Chip LeBlanc and David Canavan, to scale the business. So this shows how we use our 6Ms to assess and identify winners by looking for digital industry focus and related strengths, where Momenta can bring long-term value to the table and where we can use our resources in digital industry to contribute to the future success of these companies. And now I want to hand it over to Lee, who will talk about our ecosystem fund approach. Um, Lee? Thanks, Ben. Hi, hi, everyone. I'm Lee Carter. I'm also a principal with Momenta Ventures, and I'm located in Boston. Um, I lead most of our European investments, and, uh, and I'm here to discuss how we've developed a model of driving ecosystem growth, um, like both Stephen and Ken and Ben were talking about, through the three venture funds that we've created. Um, to, to set the stage for this, I wanted to briefly touch on how Momenta itself tackles being an ecosystem enabler. Uh, Ken was, was alluding to this previously, where our venture advisory and talent teams all gain market insights from our corporate clients, um, which, which helps our venture business uh, making investment decisions, um, as well as helping the acceleration of our portfolio companies um, with those insights, uh, which Ryan will talk about in a bit. Um, then through our experience in investing and seeing our companies grow, um, we gain additional intelligence to our advisory and talent teams, as well as our, our venture teams to our corporate partners and our fund, fund LPs. Um, this creates a, a nice knowledge cycle that benefits Momenta's ecosystem as a whole, especially our, our, portfolio, uh, our portfolio companies in Momenta Ventures. So throughout my career, I've studied how venture funds can be enablers for ecosystem growth around a technology region, company, or movement. Uh, at Momenta, we've focused our ventures on driving ecosystem growth with specific venture funds focused on technologies and movements within digital industry itself, as Ken was alluding to before. We see three key parts of how ecosystem-specific funds corporate development and government programs can help startups in the early part of their life cycle. So from the beginning on the left here, we see 
funding and incubating idea stage companies. This comes from government programs, um, early stage accelerators like the 5G Open Innovation Lab or, um, or HACS. These are really important for getting idea stage companies off the ground, um, especially in cost constrained environments um, like those dealing with hardware, which is what we find a lot of in, in the digital industry space. Um, and another very important part of this is corporate startup engagement, including co-selling um, with corporates, technical resources and executive exposure for startups. Some of the largest companies in the world have great startup onboarding uh, methods such as Microsoft for startups and some of the other ones you see here. But many large players need help figuring out how to engage the innovative startup community and everything that goes with that. And, and then finally, um, the other the other place where it's where it's help where corporates can engage with startups is with is with third CVCs or third party ecosystem funds like what what we've built in our our funds two and three um, with Advantech and Semtech which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, one of the first examples that we saw of this was actually in 2014 with Stripe's platform fund, um, helping them become the entrenched leader in online payment processing. But now we're seeing it across different industries. Um, Momenta itself is focused on the latter two buckets, um, uh, engage, helping startups engage with corporate partners um, and with their scale up funding. So with that background, we've created three funds uh, since 2014. Um, our first focused on full stack digital industry ecosystem. Um, our second on investing in the growth of low power wide area networks, as Stephen was pointing out. And our third investing at the intersection of AI and, AI and IoT, as, as all three of the previous pre presenters talked about. And I'll go through each one of these. So in our first fund, we created an ecosystem focus around the digital industry movement. We saw this. We saw this happening early on, um, but but established the fund in 2014, and really saw these these four verticals: energy, manufacturing, smart spaces, and logistics, as what we're really going to take off with the um, with the advent of digital industry. In this fund, we invest in the full technology stack um, that supports digital transformation in digital industry, from endpoint devices to enabling communication networks and application platforms. For, the, for our second fund, we took that and narrowed it into a, into a more specific thesis around low power wide area networks, because we believe that those would become the, the way that the promise of the Internet of Things would actually manifest itself over the next five to 10 years. Um, for this fund has three core investment buckets um, to support that, that thesis. Starting on the left, we invest in companies that expand the supply side of edge components. Uh, think sensors, devices, backhaul networks, gateways, anything that, that adds to um, what you need to build out a, a, a platform or a vertical solution. To leverage these, we also invest in companies that, are, that, that demand those things. So vertical applications such as agriculture, energy, smart cities, et cetera. And then finally, the things that help us deploy those at enterprise scale. Um, key capabilities to provide enterprise grade services and high scale operations. So in total, this is more things, more value and faster and better deployments. In addition to investing um, as fund two is our first um, outside fund and in addition to investing, we also do a fair amount of ecosystem building um, throughout uh, LoRaWAN, LPWAN and, and our investments. And so, um, we do things like adding new perspectives with content from podcasts, webinars, et cetera, connecting our portfolio to each other and to the broader ecosystem, include, including our LPs and other large corporates in the space. For example, in Laura, you have the folks like Google, Alibaba, Target, Amazon, et cetera. And then having a key presence at trade shows is important to add our voice and connect like-minded individuals and companies. And finally, in 2019, we launched a startup competition um, to really invigorate the startup community around um, LoRaWAN and, and how that could, could uh, manifest itself. Finally, our, our third fund, which we announced um, a month ago, is we worked with Advantech, the global leader in industrial PCs, on how an ecosystem might be built around their technology and expertise. We came up with some specific focus areas similar to what we did for our fund too, but really targeted towards um, what would make sense with Advantech's capabilities and, and, um, 
and knowledge. So the three core pillars we came up with for, for fund three were in edge enablement, Advantech strengths are in hardware and software at the edge. This, this is a part of the thesis about making it easy to manage, develop and manage solutions at the edge. Ken and Steven both talked about this earlier, but really taking advantage of what, what Advantech is good at and making that better. Second pillar, similar to fund two, is around vertical solutions. Advantech's in a great position to help startups with their vertical solutions enter new markets or, or, use, or, or develop new use cases using their best in, in class technology. And then the final pillar around addressing key adoption blockers, here focusing on, on services to address the needs of industrial IoT, such as data platforms, hybrid cloud integration, service monitoring, and anything that goes with that. And so finally wrapping it up, this is kind of what we came up with for our, for our FIT scorecard legend, similar to what Ben was talking about earlier. Um, for Advantech, it came for the um, Advantech Ecosystem Fund or the AIoT Ecosystem Fund, we came up with contribution, traction, specialization. Contribution is what impact will the company make on the ecosystem? Uh, traction is sales pipeline, ability to execute what have they shown so far? Specialization, are they domain experts? What can, can this company, does the company know what they're talking about and, and can they survive, can they thrive in this domain? And then finally, value creation level. Are they, can, can they be a small partner in the ecosystem or they, can they be a core piece of the value that, that, that the ecosystem is bringing? So that's an overview of how we built our ecosystem funds, our thesis for each and how we support them. And then also how we judge potential fit for investment. Next, Ryan's going to talk about how we help accelerate companies that we've gotten into our portfolios. Thank you, Lee. My name is Ryan McManus. I'm an acceleration partner with Momenta Ventures. And I'd like to share a few ideas around, first of all, why acceleration and in particular acceleration in an ecosystem context is so critical in the digital industry space. Secondly, a word on our approach and some of our success stories. And then finally, uh, uh, some insight in terms of really the very impactful strategic positioning and business model focus that we bring to our acceleration approach and why this is proving so helpful for our portfolio companies. And so to start, I'd like to come back to the difference between traditional venture capital and venture industrialists. So obviously venture capitalists are first and foremost about making investments into companies. We do that as well. But as venture industrialists, we see a really significant opportunity to actively collaborate with our founders and with our ecosystem partners to accelerate the commercial success, scale deployments of new technologies and capabilities and the associated value creation, not only for the startups, but actually for the ecosystem and different stakeholders uh, across that space as a whole. And this is particularly important in digital industry because digital industry has some unique characteristics compared to other technology domains. Uh, first of all, it is regularly uh, the case that several elements, several players, several ecosystem partners need to bring together their capabilities, their technologies, their, their services in order to deliver a complete solution. So this is different than, uh, for example, subscribing directly to a SaaS model or building a direct-to-consumer uh, e-commerce platform. There is a little bit more complexity uh, regularly given the nature of the space. And so when we think about ecosystems, obviously we work with startups in a portfolio of startups and we facilitate conversations and sharing and learnings across our startup community. We work with investors where we co-invest and we uh, share different insights around the, 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 the market and, uh, and look to accelerate uh, the different performance of our portfolios. But then we also have broad ecosystem relationships with automating partners and hardware manufacturers and uh, solution providers and, and SIs, which regularly comprise part of the ecosystem that our startups need to work with. We work with end customers who become the final uh, sort of purchasers of these new technology and startup capabilities. And then of course, critically, we have very deep relationships with the strategics in the industry, which is of particular uh, importance when you realize that a lot of the exits for startups in digital industry are actually acquisitions. Right. And so there's much, there's relatively fewer sort of direct to market IPOs than in other sectors. Uh, but because of the nature of digital industry, we see these strategic partnerships, strategic acquisitions as playing a much bigger role. And as such, it's important to have those uh, those early relationships uh, in place uh, as, as, as far as possible. 
So the way that we uh, deliver our acceleration methodology, we call it the assess, accelerate, and activate approach. Uh, and so the goals, of course, are to drive faster commercial traction and growth. The goals are to uh, improve the valuations for subsequent funding rounds or exits, and of course, to compress uh, what would be years of work without uh, without a sort of formal uh, approach on this into relatively fewer months of activity. Uh, and what's important with the Momenta approach is to understand that this is not a one-size-fits-all model. We meet our startups where they are. We understand that there are different capabilities, different degrees of maturity across their operating models and go to market. Uh, and it's very much a customized uh, conversation and collaboration with each of the companies individually. And so phase one is really where we dive into what our startup companies have currently, their business model, their pricing, their targets, their commercial models, et cetera. This is typically done as part of our due diligence process. Uh, phase two is where we really get hands-on in our collaboration and we focus in on the key KPIs that will move the needle for the particular company, uh, refining or jointly developing new roadmaps, business model approaches, uh, commercial go-to-market strategies, uh, refining operating models so that every team, every uh, member of the startup can, act, uh, can sort of pull together towards a similar uh, or the same uh, eventual targets and go to market strategy. And of course, this phase two is also where we dive into really specific planning for ecosystem introductions, be it for strategic partners, customers, uh, eventual uh, investors and the rest. And so as we come out of phase two, we move into phase three, which is really where those introductions uh, are activated across our network, across our partner networks. We support and drive enhanced marketing and PR for our portfolio companies. And then as we move forward, of course, we continue to work closely with our portfolio companies to provide the support in as far as we are able to do so. So I'd like to share just a few examples of, of how this has worked very well previously. Uh, so Plat1 is a company that we helped to spin out of an Italian headquarters in 2014. We invested in Plat1, we helped them to raise a Series A, moved their headquarters to Silicon Valley. Uh, we actually served as the interim COO for Plat1 and eventually uh, brought in a CEO to complement the existing founders team uh, with all of the activities that they had going on. And uh, Plat1 was ultimately sold to SAP in 2016. Thinkstream similarly was spun out of a Swiss company um, uh, in 2018. Uh, again, we worked to place a CEO with the founding team that was sold to Ublox in 2020. Uh, and then Akua is a company we're working with currently uh, where we're partnering with the CEO to support their new strategic positioning, commercial go-to-market approach, uh, development of an IP strategy and investor outreach. One final comment in terms of our acceleration. Uh, one of the things that we found very impactful is to translate the incredible technology and technical capabilities of our companies into a value proposition and a business model that describes the business benefits to customers and the ecosystem. Uh, it's very natural to focus on the technology in digital industry, but this is one of the things that we really start with in our acceleration process that can drive much more recognition and appreciation of the particular uh, secret sauce or new capabilities and talent and, keep, and technology that the companies are bringing to market. Uh, and so it's proven very impactful across all of our acceleration and it's, uh, it's really one of the first places that we start. And so with that said, uh, it's a great opportunity to drive acceleration in the particular digital industry context. Our approach is highly customized to each of our individual portfolio companies and we've seen really terrific results from that collaboration so far. And Lee, uh, I beg your pardon, Ken, I will hand it back over to you. All right, thank you so much there. All right, uh, thank you, Stephen, Ben, Lee, and Ryan for your uh, insights. So let me try to summarize what we've heard today. So five key takeaways, if you will. Number one, digital industry is hot. Uh, it has been since we started in this space, but it has really become so uh, over the last several years. Over $100 trillion of, uh, in value at stake between now and 2025 across energy manufacturing supply chain. Technology is just the catalyst. This is not a technology and investment, uh, i.e. I just invest in the technology and the, and the business ch will change behind that. The real value is in the migration of value change to value networks and value ecosystem. Watch that carefully because that is where the money is being spent and technology is simply the catalyst. Number three, 
the next wave of digital industry is at the edge. Now, many of you who have been in the operational technology area for a long time will be cringing because it has always been at the edge, but IT is just catching up. So 90% of data, 80% of processing at the edge by 2025. Whole nation states are, are betting on this, uh, this move to try to regain a piece of uh, the IT pie, if you will. Number four, digital industry investing requires deep industry knowledge and relationships. It's patient capital, it's ecosystem oriented, it invests in companies, but more importantly, it invests in the broader ecosystems. And finally, along the same lines, capital really is just the beginning. We talk about smart capital, but real smart investors are driving smart community and smart collaboration as well. Now, we uh, have gotten quite a few questions coming in and we are very tight on time. So we're going to try to do a very rapid Q&A cycle here. I asked the uh, panelists to keep it down to uh, literally just answering in bullets if you can. So number one, Stephen, what trends in connectivity are you most excited about? Um, I think the, the two biggest trends I see right now are LP WAN. If you look at the likes of uh, LoRa, they enable really long distance communication for battery uh, and uh, battery powered and constrained devices. And I think that is gonna be key, especially for the sensorization of, of basically almost everything. And the other thing that I think is really important is uh, satellite communications. We're starting to see a lot of high bandwidth satellites such as Starlink, but we're also seeing purpose-built networks for IoT um, with the likes of say fleet space and whatnot that are using really low bandwidth and again, low power uh, device enabled uh, communications direct to satellite. So I think those two are the, the ones that I'm most excited about. Lee, I'm gonna point this one at you. This one just came uh, across the transom and it's a very interesting one. Uh, I'm not sure if you can answer it succinctly or not, but with 2020 hindsight, what companies do you wish you had invested in but didn't? <laughs> That's a that's a good question, Ken. I appreciate it. I um I was I saw the the question coming. I was looking through uh, some of the passes that we've had. I don't know if I have any specific from um, from digital industry. Sometimes we see see funding announcements that uh, that a company we looked at and passed on for some reason um, were, has has raised a lot more money, and and that's exciting for them. I think where where I look at where it's interesting is to look at why we've passed and companies that become successful and why we've passed. And some of that is because we we didn't quite see a transformation happen, um, or we didn't quite see a pivot that they said they could do, and then um, we weren't sure if they could or not, and then they were able to do it. So something like um, like Senate recently um, would be an example where where they they're a LoRaWAN network provider. We really like the the team and what they're doing. And, um, and they've been able to create kind of a managed LoRa network service uh, client that's actually done quite well, um, but we weren't sure if they were gonna be able to do that and we didn't quite have the funding to help them make that happen. Um, and now they've gone on to raise a significant amount of money and do well. So that's, um, that's, that's maybe an example, but I don't, um, I don't think I have any, any regrets about any decisions that we made. Very good. So Ryan, why is Ho Creation so valuable in the context of AIoT? So you know, co-creation is it really refers to a specific collaboration between, uh, for example, a startup and a strategic or a startup or and an, and an industry leader. Uh, and it's powerful because it it's a more direct and precise mapping of capabilities, uh, be it API connectivity, be it hardware, software, sensor uh, integration. And it brings both a, a more end-to-end -end solution that uh, brings the, uh, the outcomes to market more quickly, but it also takes advantage of the intersection of new technology and the scale and go-to-market of, of, of the bigger party. So it's really an, a, a really powerful accelerator across all aspects of the ecosystem. Nice. So uh, I think we have time for two more questions. Lee, what uh, or how does Momenta's fund manager help engage startups with the bigger players? You know, we mentioned earlier in the uh, ecosystem slide. Yeah. So I think what what's important is at the beginning we we work with the companies that we're we're talking. With. We work with our LPs as well as, as other companies that that we're talking with in the ecosystem. We ask them what's worked well with startups, what hasn't and helping them identify an onboarding process with startups, whether that's um, helping with co-selling, um, helping introduce to, to the right folks in the right business units, and so knowing who to talk to. I think a lot of times 
when startups are trying to work with um, with corporates, even corporates that are really focused on their ecosystem, you 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 it's hard to find the right right business line and business unit and business unit owner um, that that Momento is is fairly well positioned to um, to introduce you to. So I think that's the most point most. Um, most important part of it, um, as well as if you need technical help, we can always. There's always a. There, there should be a path to finding a way to, to meet with sales uh, with field engineers as well. And so, helping those corporates in creating a uh, an easy onboarding uh, program is is where I think is the most important thing. All right. Finally, Ben, I'm going to allow you to close this out. So, among the six factors, which are the two you consider the most important? Uh, well, I think the two most important ones for me are management and the market size. So management clearly, because especially within the uh, digital industry space, we're looking for industrial DNA. Uh, so that's number one. And from the market size, well, in, in our segment, there is a big difference between very highly specialized vertical markets and a bigger addressable market. Um, I would add a third one, which is our momentum ecosystem value. How can we uh, support companies to be successful? So that will be my Excellent. top choices. All righty. So in closing, I'd like to thank our partners and for you, our listening audience, for sharing this time with us. If you'd like to learn more about our fund, please reach out to any of our team. Our email addresses are up on the screen. If you'd like to learn more about our digital industry ecosystem, as well as learn from key leaders' own digital leadership journeys, then please visit our website at momenta.one. Thank you and have a great day.